Hello, so what I'm going to do today is talk about the UART protocol, uh, which is basically how the UART can communicate between two devices or how the two devices can use the UART protocol to communicate. In, the, in my UART video, uh, or videos, I didn't really go through what each of the each of these settings means yeah i just wanted to go through that and next sort of explain what each of these sorts of things are and how it works and how two devices can communicate with each other so i wanted to do basically what to go through the definition of what a protocol is so a protocol is just a system of rules or accepted behavior so these are a protocol is just a set of rules that's agreed and standardized so each communication protocol has its own protocol so UART has one which is obviously what we're going to look at today so if i just google i just googled or yeah duck duck goad uh UART protocol and basically what happens is if i can find this is a better image here so the way it works is device one and device two want to communicate so you hook up two wires so the tx of device one goes to the rx of device 2 because device 1 is transmitting and device 2 is receiving and device 1 hooks up the rx pin to the device 2 tx pin and both of them need to be connected to ground um, i wanted to highlight this first of all because this is very easily done where you hook up tx to tx rx to rx but it needs to be tx to rx um, as seen here as well and they do need to have a common ground as well, which is important for the communication. And then what else we need to talk about is how this data is sent out. So this is a good image here. So basically the way it works is one packet of data, it contains all of this information. So a start bit, the data frame can be five to nine bits, five to nine data bits, a parity bit and one to two stop bits. So basically whenever a UART communication starts, this start bit goes from high to low and that lets the device two in this case. So let's say device one, wherever it is, let's say device one is communicating to device two and it's sending a character across. So the TX line here will be pulled low, like logical low. So it'll go from wherever three, three volts or whatever to zero and then this device will know okay that's where i have to i know how i have to start listening and reading in this data and then from there what happens is the data bytes get sent out so i need to get an ascii table because this is where the ascii table is really useful so uh, the ascii table is just a standard table a standardized table of how characters so your letters of the alphabet for example delete characters uh, greater than symbols less than symbols and things like that are represented as numbers for a microcontroller or in a microcontroller or in any computer i suppose um i'm trying to find like a decent image and um, this one was probably the best i'll try and zoom in i zoom in it makes it harder to read okay zoom in out Okay, it's in my night. seems to make it bigger for some reason. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, so I'm just looking at these characters. So there's capitals, A to Z, and uh, lowercase, A to Z. So in the code I'm using, if I show you that, this is from a timers example, but I'll be doing that in a different video. So I'm sending out a capital B, which is 014010. And if we look at the ASCII table for that, B is, it's a decimal value of 66, a hexadecimal value of 42, and the binary is 01000010. So that's basically the, the data frame that gets sent out. Once that's done, then there's also a parity bit. So the way this works is, so this parity bit is needed to check that this data frame hasn't been altered in any way. So if these devices are, device 1 and device 2 are really far apart, there can be electromagnetic interference or if the shielding on the wires is crap, there can be electromagnetic interference. So basically the parity bit is a way of checking that the data hasn't been altered from with thing, from things like that. So if whenever device 2 receives 
the start bit, the data frame, and then the parity bit. What the parity bit represents is if the parity bit is zero, that equals even parity. And basically what that means is whenever whenever the logic one bits are counted in, in a data frame, it should be equal to an even number and vice versa if the party bits set to one then the logic high bits in the data frame should equal an, an odd number you can forgo this like you don't have to use this i believe based on this you can set it to none and just not use it and from any research i've been doing it seems like you don't have to use it and then lastly it can have one to two stop bits so that's basically it in a nutshell the one other thing as well is if you look at the UART community, uh, the UART protocol versus I squared C or SPI, I squared C and SPI both have a clock pin, so both devices have a common clock connected to them, and that's basically so that you don't have to agree upon uh, frequency between the two devices. So that's one thing the UART does which is basically the baud rate, so it's bits per second. And it just does what it says in the tin, like this is just the amount of bits transfer per second. So it's basically 9600 hertz, I think. It's equivalent to that. So both the device one and device two have to agree upon this baud rate, otherwise the communication won't be read in properly or transmitted properly between the two devices so that's another thing that needs to be agreed upon all of this needs to be agreed upon um, in actual fact for the data to be read improperly if there was if i transmitted with a parity bit set and was trying to read without a parity bit then it would still mess up the protocol as well i believe i've never actually tried that to be fair i've only ever uh, done that with the clock not set correctly but the clock not set correctly changes the pulses that are used to, tr to transmit the bits. So now what I'm going to do is show you me transmitting the letter B over the UART and I'm going to use my oscilloscope for that. So this first bit is the UART message and the full thing. So the start bit, data frame, there's no parity bit and the stop bit and the blue line is basically what frequency that this baud rate is running at so if i change this scaling roughly speaking the 9600 baud rate equates to a frequent or a time frequency of 104 microseconds so this is as close as i can get it more or less for the 100 microseconds so we can see here on the uh, the yellow line basically the start bit drops low and then it's low for one one duty cycle so I need to run this to try and get it to match up a bit better there we go so it's low for one cycle and then if we look I, I'll try and I'll put the, the ASCII table for the character B up and try and match it some fancy oscilloscopes have this sort of built in where they'll automatically decode, but this is not a fancy oscilloscope, it's a nice basic one, but I can show you here uh, based on this. So one high low is equivalent to one bit. So the stop bit comes low, and that's low for one, one cycle. It's a bit easier if I move this over the squares to count. So basically one pulse is roughly one square here and as you can see it does move a wee bit because it's not exactly 100 microseconds but if we do roughly it's zero, zero, once, two, three, four zeros there and then it goes high and then it's high for one cycle and it drops low to a zero and that's our B character all there and then the last bit is it goes high so if I run this it goes high and if I change the, the the time scale it just continues to be high then for the rest of it and that's basically how the yard protocol works in a nutshell uh, I hope that has cleared up uh, anyone's confusion or hopefully 
help people understand a bit better what the baud rate is it's easier to probably understand this and then what we can do is look at i2c as well and that protocol and i'll be able to talk about the differences between the two and now that we have this to compare to i can sort of compare it against itc or i can compare the itc against the yard i'll also have a timer video because i had to generate a timer interrupt to uh, create my clock signal and i can basically show you how that's done as well in a different video um but that's me i'm gonna go now and chill out for the rest of the day so bye